when I think about the work that we do at Sonoma Mountain Institute, it's really about managing flows of energy and how to allocate energy and resource on the landscape. My name is Byron Palmer. I'm the grassland and herbivory manager for Sonoma Mountain Institute. Uh, we are currently located in my office at Sonoma Mountain Institute. The Institute was started in 2001 with the goal of ecological restoration. So basically interacting and observing uh, a management program and a monitoring program. So started early on with compost tea application, watershed restoration, and a pretty robust monitoring and soil science program. In 2011, the Institute decided that they wanted to start a regenerative grazing program to augment the management that was already going on. And in 2013, I came on and helped them grow that program. And since 2013, we've moved from managing uh, our home ranch and, and one additional ranch that was around 500 acres and now we're managing 10 to 11 ranches around 6,600 acres in Marin and Sonoma counties. We manage private land, we manage public land, government land, um, all using cattle and managed herbivory essentially to improve the overall ecology on the landscape. All with the, uh, the focus to improve ecology and specifically improve overall biodiversity. We've got 25 soil science locations, uh, soil monitoring locations, and we look at that data every year and then try to adjust what we're doing grazing wise based on that information. I think, you know, the way that we try to manage that energy is in a variety of ways, but we're also managing streams of, of information, right? Or streams of data that we try to turn into information so that we can actually make better management decisions. So those streams of information are grazing data and graze plans. There's photos that we're taking every single week. There's monitoring data that our biologist is gathering annually and soil data. And we take all those, those streams of, of data and through analysis, we try to turn them into information. What are they actually saying so that we can make better decisions on the ground and on the landscape to improve? I'm guessing that most of the folks that are uh, tuning into this video series are, are pretty familiar with the general tenets of uh, rotational grazing or regenerative grazing or you know there's about there's about a million names for it and um, it's very similar to politics wherever you fall and wherever you land you might have strong opinions about what it should be called and what it includes but I think at its core what we're talking about is trying to mimic these ancient ecological relationships that existed for a very long time between herbivores grasslands and predators at its root that is an ancient relationship, and it literally defined ecosystem health, right? We've got large herds of bison or pronghorn or elk moving. We've got, uh, you know, saber-toothed tigers, dire wolves behind them moving that excited energy. The grass is getting eaten, and then the grass is recovering and, rest and resting, right? And we're trying to mimic those relationships. Regenerative grazing has some you know, general uh, guideposts. They are that you wanna have some semblance of density, you wanna have a rotation and a rest period, you wanna have uh, appropriate stocking rate, meaning matching your, you know, your, your stocking rate to your carrying capacity of the land and that you're moving the animals around. And there's great argument about, you know, do you wanna move them five times a day? Do you wanna move them once every two weeks? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure people have very strong opinions about that. But in general, with rotational grazing, we are trying to move the animals uh, in some semblance of a rotation so that grass can actually rest and recover. Because as probably everyone watching this knows, when you graze a grass plant, it drops corresponding root matter into the ground. It needs to rest and recover from that actual defoliation. Uh, and if you keep grazing it, it actually prunes the roots shorter and the grass plant suffers, right? So we're trying to manage the grazing rotation by not staying anywhere too long and not coming back too soon in general. But there's a lot of variation within that. Staying with the theme of managing energy, it's when, I, when we think about or when I think about infrastructure, I'm asking a question, you know, what's the energy we're putting into the infrastructure and what are the goals that we have for that infrastructure? So it's in a, it's in a useful and helpful metric to really evaluate any of the any of the infrastructure that we have questions about right when i'm thinking about infrastructure i'm thinking about uh, you know what is the cost in terms of 
a, cu a couple of things. They're, they're both economic and non-economic. So there's the initial capital expense, there's the ongoing maintenance cost and the skills actually necessary to maintain whatever the infrastructure is, which is an extremely important cost. There's a loss in flexibility of management. So that is, that's a real cost. Um, then there's, there's a cost to animals in, the, in terms of performance. So meaning how do they, when I say animal performance, I mean their weight gain and their health. And there's also a cost to them in terms of stress. Uh, and then additionally, there's a cost in the amount and quality of labor necessary to, to perform actions within the system. And I think the important thing is to remember is that whatever type of infrastructure you're using, there's positives and negatives. And you just have to make sure that those line up with whatever your context is. I think the challenge is, is that often people will choose a, a strategy, you know, whether that is temporary electric fence or permanent or barbed wire or herding that might be inappropriate for their context. An example would be if you have a neighbor that really doesn't like electric fence and you decide you're going to replace the perimeter with electric fence because it's a third the price and maybe your animals respond to it better, that would be likely a bad move if you want to maintain a good relationship with your neighbor. You know. Additionally, if you don't have anyone in your area that knows how to build permanent electric fence that can withstand uh, you know, high winds and all the things that happen and shorts out regularly. If you don't have the electric fence expertise in your area for permanent, you might not want to install it. If you want to herd cattle or sheep or goats, but you're not actually in an area that has a high level of skilled people in that occupation, that might not be the right tool for you. So with any of these, when you're deciding how you're going to like control or influence where animals are and how they're going to stay, it is also contextually dependent. And that's why when I think about it, I'm thinking about all these factors that go into it. You know, there's the capital expense and the ongoing maintenance and the skill to use and all these things. So it's, it's tough because it's not a binary situation as nothing is. So in, in order to manage the in order to influence the management of grass, we actually need to have influence over the number of animals in a given place for a certain amount of time. And historically, this was done with shepherds or cowboys, you know, essentially people and their human calories and, you know, dogs and, and horses and their calories. And initially, the capital expense of this, you know, when we're, when we're thinking through that framework that I talked about of, of those five things, the you know the initial capital expense was low, uh, the ongoing maintenance cost and skill necessary to maintain. Well, you're not maintaining a lot of infrastructure. It's it's human labor and capital is you know essentially there's there's not a lot. It's there's a little fence, so it's you know not a lot to maintain. Um, if you just have shepherds and cowboys out there, you have a lot of management flexibility in being able to move animals to different locations and. You know, the cost to animals in terms of performance and stress uh, can really vary depending on the skill that those folks bring. And the amount and quality of labor that you need to perform that, you know, typically it can be high if, if you have to have people out there 24-7. Barbed wire came around in the late 1800s and, um, it, you know, it was an unfortunate tool that people could use to enforce property boundaries and it had a massive change on how people and animals use the landscape. The initial, when we're, when we're sort of evaluating it through this energy framework, the initial capital expense is, is very high for barbed wire. The ongoing maintenance cost of, and skill of repairing it and checking it, you know, is, is decently high. It can be low to high depending on where you're at. You lose flexibility in management. As soon as you put a fence somewhere, all of a sudden it becomes harder to move animals through or past it, um, and you're really you're you're creating artificial boundaries that you are for sure going to get wrong as soon as you put them in. Um, the cost to animals in terms of performance and stress can really vary depending on how you shape the paddocks and where they are. So there's there's a lot of variance there, and the quality of labor to perform movement in a paddock, for instance, that's fenced with barbed wire can be less, depending on how it's fenced, uh, depending on the size and the acreage, than just being an open range, though some paddocks are so big that it is equivalent to open range. Um, electric fence 
came around was first practically used in the 1930s. And when I think of electric fence as a tool to really influence where animals are and for how long, I think of two categories. So one's permanent electric fence that you're not moving. And then one is the friend of the regenerative grazer, which is temporary electric fence. And you're putting it up and taking it down all the time. Let's, let's talk about permanent electric fence. One of the real big advantages to permanent electric fence for controlling where animals are is that the initial capital expense is actually a lot less in our experience. So it might be a half to a third of what it costs to fence using barbed wire. One of the challenges with electric fence is that the ongoing maintenance cost and skill necessary to maintain it, depending on topography and tree cover and everything, can be, can be a little bit higher. It's actually challenging sometimes to diagnose what's going wrong with a permanent electric fence. So whereas most folks can fix five strand barbed wire, not everybody can fix electric fence uh, because of the diagnostic component of it, right? So that's, that's a little more challenging. You do in permanent electric systems, similar to barbed wire, you lose flexibility in management. Uh, and the cost to animal in terms of performance and stress, it can, it's really variable similarly to you know, how you're using permanent fence. Um, the amount and quality of labor necessary to perform movement within the system, you know, depending on the layout and the intensity of the fence, labor can be, it can be either high or low. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variation in there. The next, the next type of fencing, you know, that we use to sort of control animal movement is temporary. And temporary is great for a lot of reasons. You know, people, people really like it. The initial capital expense is really low. So it's, you know, it's very, it's very cheap relatively. Um, the ongoing maintenance cost though, and this is where temporary electric fencing has a, has a problem and the skills necessary to maintain are really high because temporary fence doesn't do well in the wind. It doesn't do well with high pressure. It is a psychological barrier and the animals can blow right through it. So anybody that's used temporary electric fencing material has a lot of stories about bad days when things didn't go right because you're having to control you know, how you set up the fence, how you maintain the fence, how people are interacting with the animals when they're around the fence. So there's, there's really a, a challenge with the ongoing maintenance cost component of this. Um, the one real huge benefit uh, besides low capital expenditure with temporary fence is there's a high flexibility in management. So you can set up a fence, you can change it. So it's, it's an amazing tool in that it is cheap and flexible. It just has a really high maintenance load and uh, and you actually have to have a decent amount of skill to effectively use it. You know, we're talking about all these different methods and of, of influencing where animals actually are. And, uh, you know, why we're here, we're talking about virtual fencing, right? We've, you know, we ha we've had an experience with virtual fencing, so we're here to talk about it. it. We first heard about it, or I first heard about virtual fencing back in a conference. I think it was 2009. It was at the beginning of my grazing career. And uh, the, the scuttlebutt about the virtual fencing at that point, it was only gonna be two more years and then the virtual fencing was gonna be here. So by 2011, 2012, they'd have this figured out. And it was really exciting to think about the ability and the flexibility to manage areas without fences. It is really exciting to think, okay, you know, I don't need five shepherds out there. We can use this technology to maybe exclude this hillside or exclude this riparian for these times of the year when they're really sensitive. I, it's almost like the holy grail of infrastructure. And at the time, uh, at the time, I just, I couldn't wait for it to come out. I was just chomping at the bit. Um, and I think the basic value proposition is that you're paying for the technology and you then get, you know, lower labor costs for moving and checking cattle, lower fence costs, um, an in, infinite amount of flexibility in, in where you're putting your fences. And then you're getting great data that comes in that hopefully through analysis you can turn into information about animal behavior and so the the promise of this uh, was so exciting and is so exciting when we're talking about virtual fences and virtual collars it's important to distinguish virtual fences from gps ear tags those are two completely different things and the virtual fences are a 
you know, technology that has a collar. You can draw a virtual fence on a software program and it will program the collar so the animals will stay out of that area. There are only a few companies that make that product. There are a lot of companies that are competing for a GPS ear tag. So that might give you some minor health data about temperature of the animal and where they're located, but you don't actually have the ability to draw a virtual fence. So there's, there, there are kind of two different products right now and, and they're very different. So it's important to know that for the purposes of this, we're talking about virtual, virtual fencing, which currently is used by uh, attaching a collar to the animals. So we, we partnered with a couple of landowners that were willing to help fund, uh, fund this experiment. Uh, and we decided to work with a company uh, that had, you know, had the technology uh, that was working. And they came out and part of the program is that you have to install communications towers. So they're, you know, they're maybe four feet by three feet uh, comms towers with a big mast. And so we had to go out on site. They got here in January and we had to locate those towers because those actually communicate with the uh, GPS callers uh, from, from this organization that you can then use to influence the location of the cattle and, and, and run the virtual fencing program. So they came out and um, we, we got those towers in place. We got our collars that we were going to put on the animal. We gathered all the animals up and um, ran them through ran them through our facilities and and put the collars on them and uh, and we were we were ready to get rolling. Um, it's important to note that this is a very very complicated intersection of technology. We're talking about uh, we're talking about hardware that's physically complicated. We're talking about hardware that intersects with software then how people use the software and then animals and their psychology and behavior. And they know nothing about all the other things I just talked about. They just know that they are now wearing a collar on them that you know, has the ability to make sounds and also provide an electrical stimulus. So um, it, is, it is a complex and, and, and challenging technology to, to deploy effectively. It has, great prom it has great promise, but it is also it's the management of a lot of different things coming together. And part of that is making sure that you train them to the collars appropriately. Part of that training is putting, putting the animals in an area where you have definitive uh, pasture boundaries with hard fence that can be used as visual cues and then layering on your virtual fence around those hard boundaries. But essentially, you're, you're trying to teach the animals in the shortest uh, amount of exposure time that there's an auditor auditory band when they're entering into a specific virtual fence that you put into place. And then if they keep going, that auditory band turns into an electrical stimulus unless they turn around and move in the other direction. So after we got our towers in place and we got our collars on, we then tried to control an optimum environment for the animals so that they could get a good, solid, functional learning experience with the least amount of variables possible. So we, we had two different herds that we actually did this with. We had a beef herd and we had a dairy herd. And we put them both through the training program that was recommended by the company. And um, they seemed to respond fairly well to the training program. The, the collars were working. They were connected to these, these towers. Um, and the towers were communicating with our software. We could put up these fences. And the animals respected the boundaries in those, in those training paddocks, which was, you know, which was encouraging. If you look at the virtual collars through this, this lens that we were looking at barbed wire and herding and temporary and permanent electric fence, the first, the first you know, item on the agenda is initial capital expense. And for the virtual collars at this stage of their development or the virtual fencing for this stage of their development, it's pretty high. So the collars that you have to put on the animals range around $45 a year. Uh, you have to get additional batteries, depending on how the battery life works, that can be an additional $10. If um, you also need a tower to communicate with the callers, and that's around $11,000 in that range. So 
you know, if you had if you had 250 head, that's in the range of $24,000 a year. So the initial capital expense for these animals is decently high. When you're evaluating this tool, the initial capital expense is high if you don't have a landowner partner or somebody that's willing to foot some of that bill. When you look at the second piece of the, when you look at the, the second part of the, the matrix, which is the ongoing maintenance cost and skill that's necessary to maintain, it's actually pretty high. So, you know, the promise is that there's going to be a, you know, a savings in labor, uh, a savings in labor and flexibility management, which is true in a certain way, but collaring the animals is its own activity. So you have to gather the animals and you have to put the collars on to the appropriate size. One of the other things that can happen is the collars can break uh, or, they, um, or they can fail. So you then need to sort, bring animals back in, sort them out. Um, we had a pretty high, there was a manufacturing error on the first run of some of our collars. So we had a pretty high failure rate mechanically on, on them and we dropped 30% of our collars. So we had to then go find the collars. We had to bring them back. We had to bring the animals in. We had to sort off the animals that didn't have collars, right? And this just all takes time. And you have to keep track of all those things. You have to send those collars back or you have to figure out how to repair them, right? And so the ongoing maintenance cost of all that ends up being quite a bit. Um, you also have to have really good facilities. So a lot of operators that are maybe smaller might not have a set of $50,000, $100,000 corrals that they can use to actually put these collars on. So you need a really good squeeze, you need, you, you know, you need the ability to sort, you need alleys, those kinds of things. Um, additionally, in terms of ongoing maintenance cost, uh, the animals, if you put it on a smaller animal, those animals grow in size. So you actually need to readjust the size of the collar based on the animal that's growing. And we found that in a six month period, we had to adjust the collars on growing animals at least once. So you can imagine you're gonna have to bring them in at least twice a year, probably, to adjust the collars to deal with, uh, to deal with collars that aren't working or are not functional. Another, another complicating part of the management um, and maintenance of this is as it relates to animal behavior. So if you have a hundred animals that have this technology and five of them for some reason have a failure in that technology, that could be a dropped collar, that could be a battery that dies, that could be, uh, that could be just the collar malfunctioning itself. All of a sudden those five animals are not responding to the virtual fence that you've drawn. And so they're going to create what's called a pressure budget that pulls the other animals across that virtual fence. Now they might not pull all of them, but maybe they pull a few and those few maybe pull more. And so that's just a management decision that you're going to have to make about your tolerance for which percentage of the herd is actually, uh, has the technology working. And that's just, it's a new type of, uh, management behavior that you have to engage in. It doesn't happen out of nowhere, right? Now, now all of a sudden you're having to think, you know, how many collars do I need and how, what's acceptable failure and when do I bring the animals in and all those things take time and energy. I think flexibility for this, te for this technology is where it absolutely shines and it's amazing, right? The, the idea is that you can fence out a riparian or fence out an entire area that you, you know, maybe it got burned and, and you're not going to put up an actual permanent fence and temporary fence in a lot of settings is the inappropriate tool. So let's put up a virtual fence on this burn scar or let's fence out this riparian for two years. And that is amazing. And our experience with the technology is that the flexibility was just fantastic. And I think, you know, that, that is one of the huge areas of promise with it. It should be noted within the flexibility of changing the fences is is the way that the the technology actually works so we talked about these communications towers you have to actually draw a fence on your computer upload it it goes through at&t and shows up at the tower and then the tower has to communicate with the caller and the callers talk to the towers on a regular timeline on average it's every half an hour and the animals actually have to be in the coverage area. So 
while the technology is extremely flexible, it also has a time lag. And if those animals are down in a canyon where there's not coverage, they're not gonna get that update. So while there's amazing flexibility, there's also operational constraints around how rapid you can deploy that, um, which is one of those factors that you have to learn how to manage. The fourth part of our evaluation matrix is the cost to animals in terms of performance and stress. Um, and I would say that as it relates to virtual fencing in our experience of it in our operation, which you know is important to say because I'm sure there's a lot of people that have had a wide range of experiences, um, the cost to the animals in terms of performance and, performance and stress really varies. And it's gonna be variable depending on how it's used. This one is really nuanced and complicated, um, but out of all the fence tools that I have ever directly worked with, this one has the largest capacity to produce stress on the animals and reduce performance of any of those tools that we talked about. More than temporary or permanent electric fence, more than, uh, more than shepherding, um, and more than barbed wire. Um, in general, it's thought that stress really reduces the ability of the animal to stay healthy and gain weight. So it's definitely something you're going to want to factor in is that you have a good understanding of how the technology work and how, how the technology works and how the animals are interfacing with it. The, the fifth part of that lens that we were looking at as it relates to all the different infrastructure to sort of to manage these energy flows on the landscape is the amount and quality of labor necessary to perform the management within a system. And I think the promise and the opportunity of this technology is to reduce the labor of having to build and maintain fences, of having to move animals. And that is a real, that is a real promise and it's exciting to really think about. The other side of that though, is that land management is place-based relationship. And so a lot of the time when you're actually out on land, building or fixing fence or moving animals, you're actually building relationship with place. You're learning about the patterns of behavior of the riparians and how they are at different times of the year. You're learning about the natural flora and fauna. You're, you're gathering information and data in that relationship. So while on one side, this does have the potential to reduce labor, you're also reducing, you know, you also have the potential to reduce the uh, time that you spend out there on the land. And as they say, you know, the best fertilizer are a farmer's footsteps, right? And so that's an important thing to remember as we deploy this technology to make improvements. And it has a lot of promise, but it's important to remember. In our experience, you know, looking at the promise of decreased labor, there were things that popped up that we just really didn't anticipate. Um, an example would be that uh, we would have five animals out of a group of 100 that dropped collars, or maybe it was 15. And those animals that lost their collars would walk through the virtual fence. And then we would have to make, we would have to go back and grab them, add the collars back on, we'd have to go find the collars and retrain them to the fence um, at times. And so there's, while you're replacing fencing or you're replacing uh, possibly moving the animals, you have a whole nother host of labor that is required to, to manage to actually get the technology to work well. Another part of managing this, the pressure budget of these animals with, with the technology is that young calves uh, can't be fitted with the technology yet. There's a certain size they need to get to. So if you have cows that have the technology, if they have the virtual fence collars on them and their calves walk outside of the virtual fence, those, those calves are gonna incentivize those moms to walk outside the virtual fence. So in that context, it's a harder technology to use. I personally, for our operation, wouldn't use it in that context because you're keeping the mom from being able to go uh, with, with the calf, right? So now all of a sudden, that's a new labor variable that you have to manage. Um, additionally, 
you it changes how you might locate or put water. So um, we've noticed that within the collars, and it's one of the biggest challenges of our direct experience with the technology is that where the animal is in space and where the fence is supposed to be in space has some variation. So if you draw a fence in one location and the animal says it's in another location, there actually is a standard deviation of, of where they're physically located. So if you have a water point and you've drawn an electric fence near it, or you've drawn a virtual fence near your water point and the animal comes over to your water point, it might be that the virtual fence thinks that the animal is in the wrong place because of the difference in the GPS variation, if that makes sense. So we had to be very careful and did not put the virtual fences anywhere near water points. And so that might affect your labor of where you're putting water and how you're putting water and, and what you can do. I think the, the promise of virtual fencing really does exist. The, the first time I saw the grazing data of the animals and where they're showing up in space, a time-lapse video of how they were grazing, I realized nothing was ever going to be the same again in understanding uh, how animals are using the landscape. I mean, this is an explosion in information and we don't even know how to use it yet. And it's extremely exciting. Um, as it what it means for the viability of, of your business, if you have a small operation or a medium-sized operation, I think it's not the right tool until the costs come down uh, and until the battery life improves or the, the management of the technology improves. Like I think of if I was running a, you know, if I was running an operation by myself, it's a pretty labor intensive activity to bring the animals in, get the technology right and keep it going. Um, so I, I think it makes more sense on a larger scale at bigger at bigger resolutions. Um, so I don't I don't think it's you know based on our experience. If I was running a small operation or even our sized operation, uh, which is around 6,600 acres and 1,500 head, I, I don't think it's the appropriate tool in that context yet. Until price comes down, battery life improves, um, until you have to handle the hardware a little bit less. When when I think about the virtual fencing technology there's a number of things that are going well. The first thing that they have that works really well is actually the communications. And uh, you know they, they have a communications background, the organization that we were working with. Um, so the, the callers, the virtual fence callers ability to actually talk with the computers and, and, and with the towers is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, and the range on these things is, is amazing. So I think that part of the tech with the organization we were working with was working really well. The grazing data, the seeing the animals move through space, amazing seeing that history of data. And I think it's gonna reveal so much and so many new insights about animal behavior and, and grazing patterns are, are going to come out of that. The other thing that's really phenomenal about the technology is even if you're not using it to gather the animals, which we only tried once and decided we were gonna just manually gather them, it's really helpful to find and locate the cattle on big landscapes. If you've got a 500 acre paddock with a lot of places to hide, uh, this is a great technology for being able to find them. I think there's a, there's a ton of potential for the virtual fencing collars once more, once more integrated health data comes in. Once you have the temperature of the animals, data streams like that, that are integrated into the virtual fence technology, I think it's gonna be hugely impactful in being able to attend to a sick animal that you otherwise wouldn't be able to attend to. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be phenomenal in your ability to deliver targeted care because a lot of the time you won't know until possibly it's too late. So I think there's, there's huge opportunities there. There's a lot of things that this technology does really well. And like any new technology, it's, uh, it has all these areas for improvement and learning and growth. I, it, it kind of reminds me of a violin that dropped out of the sky that no one really knows how to play yet, right? I mean, you've heard a lot of people play the violin and, um, and they might not have made it sound too good. And if there was no one that knew how to play it, it'd probably take a really long time for people to learn how to play it. And that's kind of what's happened with these virtual callers. They, you know, they've come down from the sky. A lot of people have worked really, really hard. And where animals and people and software and hardware and topography and ecology are all intersecting. 
that is complicated. And it's a whole new field that needs to be flushed out and developed with best practices and learnings as it relates to all those things intersecting. And so there's a lot of room for this whole new field to develop. And frankly, we need people that are really passionate about helping that intersection come together gracefully. Um, I'd say first and foremost, the most important area for development and improvement as it relates to virtual fencing is to take the uh, to take the technology at this point it's a collar and have it have some flexibility on a per animal basis. So right now the way these the way that the collar works, the virtual fence collar for the virtual fence, is that you program a uh, sound barrier and a stimulus barrier. And if the animals walk into the sound barrier, the, the collar makes an auditory noise. And if they go into the stimulus barrier, then they receive an electrical stimulus. The challenge with that, when you're doing it across the board with the same profile for every animal, is that animals behave differently to stimulus. I have dogs. I use corrective collars at times for things like keeping them from eating my daughter's chickens. And one of the things that I know is that out of my five dogs, all five of them need a very different level of stimulus to not eat a chicken. Most of them actually just need a little vibrate on their collar. And that is enough to keep them away from the chicken. One of my dogs actually disregards electrical stimulus altogether and doesn't even care. And so with this huge variation in the way that animals experience uh, a physical stimulus and stress, the challenge with deploying the technology is that you're going to have a percentage of animals that the stimulus is appropriate for, and then you're going to have a percentage on either side where it's not enough or where it's too much. And I think the biggest opportunity for growth is creating a software interface that allows for pattern recognition of individual animals and how they interact with the technology. And on the front end, hopefully that would be for the training period, a breaking in period of seeing how the animals individually interact. Another area where the technology has room to grow and improve, I think is managing the administration of the collars. So I think eventually, whether it's a collar or an ear tag or whatever the technology ends up, it is extremely time consuming to see which collar is working. I mean, imagine this. Let's say you got 300 cows standing in a pen and it's collar 756X that's not working. And you're like hanging your head underneath.